like to call the regular monthly meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order for December 1st, 2021, the last meeting of 2021. In-person meeting at the Watertown Municipal Center, Town Council Chamber, uh, 61 Echo Lake Road, Watertown, Connecticut. I'd like this meeting to come to water, but before we start, uh, we all here are for various reasons, and I'm sure attention will be paid and respect for all. Carol, would you please call the roll? Yes. Raymond Antonacy. Present. Richard, Richard Antonetti. Here. Ken Demiers. Here. Dan DeVito. Here. Dan Gelati. <coughs> Lou Esposito. Bob Marinero, Here. Dave Polk, Here. Lou Cavallo, Here. Joe Duva. Here. For the absence of uh, Commissioner Esposito, I will place as a regular member <coughs> Commissioner Marinero. So be it. The next matter is, of course, we're going to have public participation, and we have various items uh, on there for participation. Please limit uh, comments regarding matters that are not uh, officially on the agenda. So any matter that is not on the agenda, it is open for statements from the public. You have a mic. Please state your name and address if you have something to say. Public participation, public participation. Public participation is closed. Let's move on with the order of the agenda. There are, order, there are agendas available and material if you are looking for how we are going to be moving. Acceptance of the minutes, uh, this requires a vote. Do I have a motion for the November 3rd, 2021 meeting? Do I hear a motion? I make a motion to accept the minutes for November 3rd. Motion has been made. Do I have a second? Second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, abstention, hearing none, the motion is carried unanimously. We then will go to a staff report. Mark, do you have anything to report at this time? Good evening, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Just a couple of things. Uh, I have um, received uh, informal guidance from the uh, subcommittee that's uh, look, reviewing the, uh, the zoning regulation changes and uh, implementing <coughs> uh, means for them to uh, further review the uh, proposed uh, changes and revisions uh, to bring to the um, to bring to the committee to, to bring to the commission as a whole, um, hopefully in a in a couple of months. Uh, we've been working on a final adoption of, a, uh, of the hazard mitigation plan. Um, it's a region-wide plan uh, of um, <clears throat> all, the, uh, all the surrounding towns that um, looks at uh, natural uh, uh, hazards and uh, attempts to, to provide mitigation uh, for them with uh, planning and um, preparation. Uh, and the uh, town is in the process of uh, just adopting uh, that. <clears throat> I've, I've been serving on the Steelbrook uh, uh, Greenway Committee that is uh, choosing a consultant to, uh, to implement, to design and implement uh, the next phase of the, of the Steelbrook uh, Greenway. Um, so that's uh, going forward. Uh, of course, we've been uh, talking to a variety of of folks that are starting up or bringing businesses uh, into town. Um, that uh, seems to occur on a fairly regular basis. Um, one uh, uh, of note is actually a property on Hinman Road uh, that mostly lies in uh, Bethlehem that's being looked upon as a um, as a venue for uh, such events as weddings, uh, car shows, things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> the access is into uh, Watertown, and we're uh, just dealing with them to see 
what the review process might be uh, in terms of uh, traffic uh, and all. Um, that's all that I have to report for, for today, unless you have any questions. Are there any questions from members of the commission to, to Mark? Any questions to Mark? Mark, on that greenway, is that the one that will exit onto French Street? Yes, one, uh, one point is on French Street. That would be the, I don't know what direction that is, but the, uh, the crossing of French Street to connect with the existing uh, greenway, and it would go, uh, it would travel up towards the, <clears throat> up towards the high school, past the, uh, past the soccer fields and the, uh, the, the almost new dog park, uh, and connect with the, um, with the uh, existing greenway in that area. Right. I, I know uh, we are considering for that, uh, it's a mid-block crossing, a flashing beacon for the safety of people that would be on the greenway and crossing. That yes. That is a thing that we have put in for, and I think that would be an asset. The state is citing certain places that would have these beacons for safety, so... I just that, wanted to check if that yes, was Yes, that would be a very similar beacon to what's proposed on Main Street. Uh, some of the consultants have a <clears throat> interesting and creative design for actually that, um, that French Street area because uh, right next to, adjacent to the fire department, uh, the town owns a, a, a bit of land and there's uh, ideas for creating rest area there and some parking and some pedestrian, again, rest areas along with that, that crossing uh, in that uh, area. That's, that's Thank correct. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? Okay, well, let's move forward on our agenda. Uh, <coughs> Carol, would you like to read the legal notice, please? Uh, I'm sorry, this one is the continued public hearing, so we don't need it yet. Okay. This is for a uh, continued public hearing number one for uh, Castellillo. Okay. Uh, the item on the agenda is a site plan uh, for a permit of 2021-20-2. Uh, uh, Carmine uh, Castellillo for the construction of a Garden Brook Estates on 470 uh, Turnpike, uh, Straits Turnpike, Watertown, Connecticut, in an R12 5 age restricted housing development. The overlay zone parcel, uh, parcel uh, 1D, is that correct? 1D, Mark? Is that 1D ID? ID map uh, 152, block 256, lot 3. Uh, is the applicant here? Yes, sir. Good evening. And can you please turn your mic on? Thank you. Second from the right, Carmen. Okay, yeah, good. good. That's good enough. <clears throat> good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commission members. My name is Sev Bovino Panner of Kratz and Jones, representing the applicant. Uh, the map that I have on the easel here for orientation purpose, this is Straits Turnpike North is up on the map, and the pro proposed project is uh, to be built on the West side of. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You might have to speak right into the mic. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. That's okay. The project is proposed to be built on the west side of Straits Turnpike, uh, located um, um, the address, I believe, is 470 uh, Straits Turnpike. 470 Straits Turnpike. Uh, the land area for the property is 4.92 acres, uh, served by all the utilities, water, sewer, and gas. The proposal is for 18 units of age-restricted housing. The allowed number of units under your regulation is 29. The proposed units are duplexes uh, with master bedroom on the first floor with a one-car garage meeting uh, your regulations. 
We propose nine visitors uh, parking spaces. Uh, it will be on porous material like brick pavers. Um, at the last meeting, the commission expressed interest in having uh, visitors parking, and uh, we propose nine based on staff recommendations. We spread them throughout the site. We have uh, two on the right side as soon you pull in between these two units. Then we have uh, three here, two and two. So they're spread out throughout the site so that it doesn't look like a parking lot for a retail center. Um, we propose landscaping around the units, a low shrubbery, uh, flowering shrubs and uh, evergreen and uh, street trees along the driveway on the right and the left side of the driveway. Each unit will have a, a private patio in the back of the unit. Uh, the street and unit lighting is proposed to be full cutoff LED lighting. Uh, there's a poles proposed uh, from the street up to the cul-de-sac. Uh, the proposed open space exceeds the 35% requirement. The area at the top of slope will have a wooden fence with plaques on it indicating that there's open space uh, to the north uh, associated with a brook. Um, the IT manual indicates that this is a low traffic generator. The site is expected to generate four morning trips entering and seven exit, exiting. Um, in the afternoon peak hour, seven will be entering and five exiting. The, the peak hour is considered to be 7.15 to 8.15 in the morning and 4.15 to 5.15 in the afternoon. The driveway has a good side distance of 520 feet south, 530 feet north, um, actually all the way to the signal that the signals that they're there on uh, straight turnpike. Uh, in our opinion, there are enough gaps in the traffic to allow safe left turn movements after the town approves this project and before construction begins, an encroachment permit will be required by DOT. They do not act until the town acts. Uh, we believe that this project is good for the community. We ask that this commission considers um, acting favorably on the application. If you have any questions, uh, I would be glad to answer. Thank you, sir. Any questions uh, from the uh, members of the commission? Any questions? from members of the commission. Commissioner Duva, is your hand up? No. No, okay. <clears throat> Seeing none, Mark, do you have any questions? Uh, no questions there, Mr. Chair, just a couple of comments. Um, <clears throat> uh, obviously, this is a continuation uh, of discussion from the uh, past, uh, from the November meeting, uh, some changes that have taken place uh, are the, uh, as, uh, as indicated, the nine, uh, nine visitor spaces uh, are now proposed um, under uh, uh, advice of the commission and staff. Um, that um, standard actually we applied or suggested it could be applied from the number of visitor spaces for an AR, ARHB development, which would be a much larger uh, development, but similar. Uh, so that um, that worked out. Uh, the uh, current maps, which are now dated to a uh, 12121, uh, reflect a relocation of visitor parking spaces outside of the front setback uh, to address a comment from the town engineer. Um, just to reiterate, um, the applicant is proposing a 10% um, affordable uh, units. That would uh, be two, a total of two units. Um, parking requirements were uh, questioned uh, previously, and we can confirm that uh, one parking space per dwelling unit uh, is the standard. Uh, it does, the regulations do not specify the specific location, although they one of the standards is to have a garage, a garage space, um, which uh, to, to me indicates just to virtually to have, have a garage uh, un uh, in, that, in each unit. Um, <clears throat> as, um, as Mr. Bovino was, uh, commented, it's subject to Connecticut DOT review for, for an encroachment to the state highway. And I had asked him, and he has provided you with information with regards to traffic. 
Um, just to note, the final uh, town engineer review is dated 11-29-2021, uh, uh, and it appears that um, all comments have been uh, addressed to his satisfaction, not to speak for him. Um, and uh, that's what I have. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Just uh, want to comment, uh, one of the issues, uh, other issue was sidewalk uh, to the uh, um, crossing, uh, crossing there at, uh, was, is there a sidewalk uh, down to the corner? There's a sidewalk uh, uh, all the way to the corner on the south side, and then the sidewalks across the street in both directions going uh, to the signals. That's a very busy street, and I think uh, that was necessary. And I'm, Happy that you did do that uh, traffic report site distance. I think that is also a matter of safety for cars turning left and right and having the proper site distance and then looking forward to DOT approval once we pass it here, if we pass it. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, have any other comments? I will ask for public no, comment now. No, sir. Is there anyone here from the public that would like to comment on this development? Is there anyone here that would like to comment on this development? Anyone here? Seeing none, I will then ask the applicant. Any further comments from the applicant? No more comments. Thank you, sir. Any further comments from commission members or staff? I'd like to. Through the sure. chair, make a comment that the last time we were here, I had a problem with tandem parking. But when I refer to section 34 of the regulations, which are reviewed today, there's only a requirement for one parking space per dwelling for age restricted housing. So this does comply. So I stand corrected. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, is there any further comments uh, from uh, the Public, any further comments? Comments from the public? And lastly, applicant, we are finished. Very good. Seeing that that matter is finished, I think we are ready to close the hearing. I, I, have, I have one comment. Yes. Make through the chair. Mark, in your report, did I hear you correctly? And did you say that two units were going to be? assigned to affordable housing? Sure. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. We're at the stage now where we can close the public hearing. If somebody would like to make a motion. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Motion has been made. Do I have a second? I'll second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstention, hearing none, motion is carried unanimously. New public hearing, I believe we will read at this point uh, the legal notice. Carol? Yes, Town of Watertown, Connecticut, Planning and Zoning Commission legal notice. The Planning and Zoning Commission of the Town of Watertown, Connecticut will hold a public hearing on Wednesday, December 1, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. in the Watertown Municipal Center, Town Council Chambers, 61 Echo Lake Road, Watertown, Connecticut, to hear a proposed text amendment to the Watertown zoning regulations to allow professional office use within the R20 zoning district limited to those properties located on Connecticut Route 6, parentheses, Woodbury Road, R20 residential district. The proposed amendments are as follows. Section 12.4, Table of Permitted Uses and Structures in Residential Districts, insert professional offices as a special permit site plan use in the R20 limited to properties located on Connecticut Route 6 Woodbury Road. Section 12.6 uses and structures permitted in specific residential districts and new 12.6.18 in the R20 district professional offices may be permitted by special permit and site plan approval but limited to those properties located on Connecticut Route 6 Woodbury Road. 
A copy of the application is on file in the Planning and Zoning Office, Watertown Municipal Center, 61 Echo Lake Road, Watertown, Connecticut, between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m., and in the office of the Town Clerk, 61 Echo Lake Road, Watertown, Connecticut, between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m., dated in Watertown, Connecticut, this 18th day of November 2021 and 25th day of November 2021, Luigi Cavallo, Secretary, Planning and Zoning Commission. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. The applicant uh, here tonight. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. For the record, Michael McVeary, that's the from 35 Porter Avenue in Naugatuck. On behalf of the applicant, uh, Grady and Riley, LLP, which is a Waterbury law firm. Welcome, uh, Attorney McVeary. Thank you, sir. Um, We've been before the commission your last two months. In October, we came in just to discuss the concept that we're dealing with, and then we filed an application last month for the text amendment. Now, what we've done with our proposal is, in addition to amending the text, if the commission sees fit to do that, but also have a requirement that it's got to be done by a special permit site plan approval. So it's not a blanket approval of just allowing a professional office within this zone, within the area of this zone, uh, giving the commission a lot more discretion as far as the actual proposal that's before us. What you've got in front of you tonight is not a site-specific application. It's, a, it's an application to allow the use within the zone. I think Mr. Massoud's memo indicated there's perhaps 24 residents on, on the street that would, in this area, that would fit the, the particular parameters of our proposal. Now, the commission's obviously aware that you act in two, when you act in, in dealing with zoning, you deal two different ways. One is a legislative capacity in which you're amending the zoning regulations or the zoning map, and the statutes and the law give you a very broad, broad discretion in that. Then you also can deal with the site plan, the special permits, and the site plan where you're dealing in your administrative capacity where you've got to follow the regulations and what's allowed within the regulations. So my client is the contract purchaser of property at 325 Woodbury Road. Having said that, we've got to remove that from our deliberation tonight because we're not dealing with the property at 325 Woodbury Road, we're dealing with the area on Woodbury Road which lays within the R20 zoning district. Um, I think if you look at your regulations, uh, section 12.4, and what's allowed within the R20 zone, there's a lot of uses that would be a lot more intensive than a professional office. Uh, for example, um, under the special permit, a child daycare center or group home, convalarium, convalescent home, private hospital or, or sanitarium, a nonprofit institution, which is pretty general, a summer day camp, private recreational facility, uh, public utility building uses and facilities, governmental buildings or with town or state of Connecticut or federal government, railroad right away or passenger station, which is not something we're looking at, telecommunications facilities, uh, bed and breakfast accommodations. What we're proposing is an office, the, a professional office, which again would have normal office hours, nine to five, eight to 5.30, as opposed to what would be allowed under your regulations with these other varied uses. Um, we're trying to would bring something in that would be less intrusive allow for the, um, the property to be used within this district, to be used as an office, uh, with the board having the ability, when you, come to it, when, when you come to that point, to basically approve what you want to approve for the use of the property. Uh, we're looking at a minimal change to the character of the, of the properties. Uh, but again, we're not talking about and it's difficult. We're not talking about this particular piece, 325. We're talking about the concept in general. In the event you see fit to approve the text change, 
we would then be back with architectural, um, engineering, everything along those lines. Wetlands approval, we understand we'd have to deal with the historic commission, but this is just a preliminary very first step on, on the application process. I don't know if you have any questions or if I can answer anything you may have. Any questions from members of the commission? Any questions? I just want to highlight one more, uh, some comments uh, you've made uh, of negative features that currently exist. Um, one, you mentioned something about a day camp uh, could be put in there. That's under your regulations. A summer right. day camp is allowed. Is there a pool on that property right now? That I'm not sure of. But yeah. uh, at the end of the property, I was looking at the map. And, and I, I did see a pool. So a summer camp, please, no comments from the audience. Uh, the summer camp would be able to utilize the pool. There would actually be a large amount of traffic bringing children in. There is also a pond on the property as well. And a pond, too. Yes. Okay. So there is a pool and a pond. The other thing you said, uh, it could be opened up to a bed and breakfast. Under your regulations. Under yes. our regulations yes. currently. So that means, uh, again, uh, cars coming in, people staying overnight. I noticed that what is happening in, with large properties like this, you can break the housing, and uh, I think in neighborhood uh, towns, they take and make several apartment houses out of the large uh, building. I don't think this is appropriate. They can only do two. They could divide this into two apartments. Am I clear on that? I Mark? would defer to Mr. Masood yes. on that. Am I clear that they could have an apartment and then divide it into another apartment and maybe other apartments? So it could become a complex with apartments? Not necessarily, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you could have a, uh, what we limited to, a <clears throat> A two-family a two-family dwelling a conversion to a two-family dwelling would be uh, uh, would be appropriate. Uh, typically, uh, with in terms of a uh, <coughs> an apartment, uh, you're limited to one to one apartment. So anything above that would be illegal, actually. Okay. Well, there's something else you mentioned that could be used for uh, several a. Um, public utility building, um, private recreational facility, not defining what that means, a convalarium, convalescent home, private hospital, or sanitarium. Right. We just recently had an issue on elderly housing and whatnot, and we turned it down, but according to the federal and state law, we had to approve it. So if it was an uh, elderly convalarium, uh, that could be that for that use also. Certainly. Also, there is a temporary special event use, so that would be really subjective based upon what the, what the proposal was for. Yeah. I think it's important that we understand exactly what exists now as to what can go in there, and I think clarity is very important. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna move the matter forward. Uh, I believe the, uh, no comments from other commissioners. Uh, no comment. Uh, we'll go to public comment. Any comment uh, to the public? The mic is on the other side. If you want to come on down, state your name. Please come forward. Your name and your address. Good evening. The mask is a problem. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Jean King, 126 North Street, Watertown. Um, we've met before. Um, I'm the chair of the Watertown Historic District Commission, um, and that's one of the reasons I'm here, but not entirely. Um, I'm very concerned about the idea of your um, making a change for one piece of property by changing an area for a number of pieces of property. 
Um, and I hope that, among other things, that you folks will have a, a site visit and go out and walk around that neighborhood and see what properties are actually there because the property that's being discussed for the law firm is large, but most of the ones along there are not. Um, all of the properties are in the historic district with m maybe one exception. And I know Mr. Masood's giving you a great map that shows all of this. Um, I think it's just a really bad idea to make a change that affects things that, that no one has asked for. No one in our community has come forward. We have a plan of development for town which has been adopted by you and by the town, which talks about areas that are residential. R20 is residential, R10 is residential. We, certainly it is appropriate for us to have more um, professional offices and commercial areas, but we have, we have areas designated for that. It isn't the main street going through town, through Watertown and Oakville, has a lot of different opportunities and other places for properties. So it's unclear to me why we need to change the zoning in this area that will affect a lot of properties that are, you know, the historic district, these properties are different, they are part of the district, but they represent different characters and different times when housing was built there, a, a wonderful collection of housing along there, um, and residents who live there and want to continue to live there. But I think you all also understand that when you start to change one piece of property in terms of the designation, that it could have not positive but perhaps negative effects. And I noted that Mr. Um, Masood said, the inclusion of professional officers as a permitted use will likely have the effect of change of character to the area, particularly for the properties located within the historic district. Um, I just don't think we need to do this. And I am not, I mean, I would really happy to have Grady and Riley have a really nice law office in our town. Maybe they'd like to be in the Munson House. That would be a really wonderful place to have, <laughs> have that, because there's parking there and it's where there's some other things going on. But I think there are areas in our town where we can have that kind of commercial or professional development, not commercial, I understand that. Um, and I think that's what you should consider really carefully about the whole idea of changing this. Um, and it isn't just the historic district, it is the whole center of our town in many ways. Um, I look at the difference, for instance, driving through Watertown, through that section that is designated as proposed if you would drive through Woodbury, which is a lovely historic community, but the uses for professional things along the road through the middle of that town have really not been um, positive for the historic character, even with a historic district. Um, I noted that there's an, in the packet there's a number of letters of support from people who think it's a great idea for the, the firm of Brady and Riley to come here and have a law offices. That's not what we're really talking about. You're talking, and it's, you know, we're not talking as Mr. McVeary, excuse me, um, said, we're not talking about just this piece of property. That's really a separate thing. Um, this property is, if, I don't know if you've it's a beautiful home. It has been gorgeously restored historically inside as well as out. Um, that is not, you know, my historic district commission only looks at the outside. Uh, there is, um, and I understand that there also have been um, offers of other people who would like to buy the house for residential use. So it isn't, I'm, I'm not, I don't think it's your job or my job either to figure out how people get to sell their properties or change the zoning to sell their properties. So um, if you had any questions related to the historic district implications, I'd be happy to talk about it to you. But I hope you'll also continue this hearing and take a walk along that whole section of um, Route 6 and Woodbury Road there. It's really very pretty. No sidewalks, um, among other things, except on, in a, a small area. Um, but mo there's really no sidewalks along there. Um, but it's really, it's a beautiful part of our town, and it would be a shame to really do things that would change that character without really a need to do that. I would like to assure you that uh, I have been over in that area of Hamilton uh, Street and also uh, Buckwheat uh, mm -hmm. Hill there, and it's a very pretty area. I, I was impressed with the beautiful stone wall around there, the high shrubbery yes. and 
the uh, driveway to the uh, property is uh, rather large. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sure members have gone over there. We just don't blindly, you know, act on something. I want to assure you that we do. But, but uh, I, and our concern is also not just that property. I mean, because I understand that too, in terms of looking at that property. I wouldn't have, I really don't have an opinion personally one way or the other about how that particular property is used, but I'm really concerned about the implications for the 20, about 27, did you say Mark? 24, 24 properties that are along Route 6 there, because that will make a difference. Um, if there's a way to do something another way, that, that may be a way to do it. I understand that we can't do spot zoning either, but um, it's, it's, there are significant differences that will, have real major impacts on our town um, in terms of why people want to live here and why people want to buy houses in this town and why people want to buy property to, to live in with their families. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Yes, sir. Please state your name and address. My name is Hugh Thornton. I if, live at if you want to lower oh. your mask, you'll be My clear. My name is Hugh Thornton. I live at 46 Litchfield Road in Watertown. I want to further what the last speaker said um, about rezoning and about rezoning a beautiful neighborhood like that by presenting an image, say, of Bristol, Connecticut, where the, where where uh, poor city planning allowed for neighborhoods to be turned into duplexes and triplexes and sort of gutted the soul of the city. Um, I think that what happens is if you put in an office space in a residential neighborhood, the houses next to it become cheapened because nobody wants to live with a parking lot next to them or have the lights of the parking lot next to them. Um, and then eventually they have to sell out or to sell out, uh, sell out maybe as duplexes or triplexes. The neighborhood changes. So really what I'd like to, to offer in terms of that view is to not let the city go in that direction, but to rather focus, um, focus its direction on revitalizing Main Street in downtown and bringing businesses to Main Street to make that lively and not let the sprawl of Main Street sprawl out and infect neighborhoods which are already at their height of beauty. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? <coughs> yes, sir, over here. I did see, ma'am, yes. Please state your name and address. Gail Curacillo, 51 Hamilton Lane. I live on Hamilton Lane, two houses down from this beautiful home. The parking or the driveway is not on Route 6. It's on Hamilton Lane, number one. Number two, it's going to put more traffic on Hamilton Lane. We have enough traffic going past my house daily with the school. People do not come in from Route 6. They come in from Hamilton Avenue, go to the school, and now there is enough traffic. We do not need any more. It's a beautiful neighborhood. Let's not put something there that doesn't belong in a residential area. That's all I have to say. Thank you, ma'am. Is there someone over on the left? Ma'am? Hi, Patricia Norman, 271 Woodbury Road. Please uh, state that into the oh, mic. And Patricia Norman, 271 Woodbury Road. I live directly next door to this property. And uh, please, that's it, thank you. The phone was on somewhere. To take it with Watertown, I've been in Watertown like all my, all my life. And when you look around and you see like all the businesses that 
took over homes and made them businesses, the lawyers, the insurance companies, the doctors, the dentists. None of them ever can go back to being homes, but most of them were in the business area, and I can't think of any of them that are really nice. They end up with big parking lots in their front yards. They're not used with the residents. There's something about when you have the roof over your head that you take care of it. And with Watertown hasn't protected its history. Like when you look at the Munson House, the town hall, the town hall annex, the Munson House was donated to the town. No mortgage and they still couldn't take care of it. And it's always like money, 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 but the residents take care of their homes. They don't have more money than the town of Watertown, but they have the pride of taking care of it. The R20 zone is the only thing that protects our street from changing all these houses into law offices, dentist offices, or whatever else, else is gonna be if the zone is changed. Spot zoning is illegal. I still believe it's illegal, I think. So with spot zoning, <coughs> you're only changing one parcel at the detriment of the other people but because the lawyers know spot zoning is illegal, they've included all of us. We don't want it. Like, we just don't want it. That's the R20 zone protects our homes and none of our homes are crumbling. But a lot of the homes that have been taken over by businesses, but they're in the business zone, none of, not very many of them look that great. I don't want our front yards to become parking lots because a dentist has come in or you know, something on that type of thing. Right now, I believe you could have a home business and live there, and there is pride in when it's the roof over your head. And I think that, and the other thing to bring up just here is that one of the um, partners of this law firm sits on the town council. So I hope that doesn't make it a favorable person to have a shady deal. I'm not accusing you, I just hope that that doesn't become, that that person is a favorable person for this type of thing. Just, that's my hope. <laughs> and the, could I ask the commissioner, the chairman a question of, we used to get notified if there was anything that was having in the properties, if there was a planning and zoning, a public hearing regarding something that would affect the properties, like I think it was a 500 foot, or I'm not sure on that foot, but like if something was coming up of a public hearing that was in the neighborhood, we used to get letters. We, is that not done anymore? Mark, uh, the, as far as changing a zone, is there posting anywhere, is that required? Not by a text amendment. Right, not yeah. on a text amendment. See, that's tricky. Now, that's a little tricky thing right there because it's not a text amendment. It's changing our zone from an R20. It's a change of zone. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your right. consideration. Is there anyone else, I believe, over there, sir? Yes? Could you please state your name and address? Yeah, it's uh, George Norman. Uh, I live at 271 Woodbury Road. Uh, I'm the abutting property owner to uh, 325 Woodbury Road. Uh, I have to be careful what I say because I'm sitting next to an attorney here, so I'll be very careful. You're being taped as well. I'm being taped, okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, uh, Gene King uh, got up and spoke and did a very nice job. Uh, I've, having researched what the historic district's uh, input and value is, is basically is they provide a certificate of appropriateness. Uh, use of this site is not appropriate. Uh, this property is on 3.3 acres, give or take. Uh, it's on a corner lot, Hamilton Lane, Woodbury Road. Uh, the property has 
uh, a very large home. It's a beautiful home. It's a magnificent home. Uh, with that home is a swimming pool, a below ground swimming pool. Uh, there is a, a pond that's been uh, redug and resettled. And in the rear is a uh, basically a, uh, a brook or a stream. So on this property, you have quite a lot of activity uh, with Mother Nature. It's a beautiful site. Uh, and the driveway is on Hamilton Lane, uh, which is a very narrow road. And you have a Judson School. Now, Judson School is named after uh, Mr. Judson, who built our house. And next door, at 325, that house was built by uh, Mr. Lilly, who was a short-term governor of the state of Connecticut. So there is a lot of history going on within our area. Uh, the issue really comes down to why the change, and since I didn't bring my glasses, I can't read it, uh, but basically the R20 zone only allows a single family or maybe a two family. And in the use of the two family, it's very, very restrictive on that uh, as to how that can be used. And it, it provides uh, specific recommendations. As, uh, as far as the attorney's approach on uh, special plan and special permits uh, for the use of the properties uh, in a residential zone, which he's correctly read off of uh, uh, the planning and zoning reg regulations, uh, those are items that are, in some cases, extremely extreme. But a professional office can be, can be a funeral parlor. It can be anything you want to call professional, because today words don't mean anything. So people will question anything that you call professional. So here we sit next to it, and our house abuts it, and they want to change the entire area. Uh, 20 some odd homes, 24 homes, I believe, are at risk. Uh, the the pur purpose of which is basically, it's a difference between, uh, I would say, a zone change and basically spot zoning. It's right in the midst of it. Here they've taken one house, taking it out of the cluster, and we basically end up uh, the victims of their wants and needs. Now, every property has a value. If for some reason the seller's value does not meet the market, then the seller's responsibility is to reduce the price. Or if the market is strong, he can increase the price. So it comes down to why hasn't the property sold? It's usually price. Price determines all things, so that's the issue. It's got nothing to do with uh, the use of the property. It's, it's, a, it's probably one of the most choice properties in Watertown, one of. Uh, so we're very much against it. Uh, I've raised my family there. My children both have gone to school in Watertown, one at Taft, one at uh, uh, Watertown School Systems. Uh, we've been there over 50 years. Uh, our property is, is well cared for. We made a major investment in it. If you look down the street, all the homeowners have made major investments in their properties. This will diminish the value of the properties immediately because a commercial use of a residential zone diminishes the value. I've been in real estate 50 some odd years, so I'm not speaking as too much as an amateur. I'm not too professional, but I'm not that much of an amateur. So I, I speak basically on what markets, market conditions, this will affect the market conditions very dramatically to the negative side. Now we have Taft School, we have Judson School, we have plenty of areas that basically that have a lot of students, kids walking around, a lot of buses, a lot of activity, we don't need any more activity than we have. Route 6 is a busy place, as we all know. So adding more to it doesn't add any value. Now, in a law firm, 
which I'm not against lawyers at all, uh, they, they serve a very good purpose. Uh, but in a law firm, you have lawyers, you have staffs, you have paralegals, you have clerics. It's not just one or two people. It's gonna be a big parking lot, a lot of activity, and they also have clients coming <coughs> whatever hours they come. So there's gonna be much too much activity going on, and we should not bear the brunt of somebody who's trying to sell the property and maximize the profit. That's their problem. That's the American market. That's the way it is. So there's plenty of other opportunities. And I'm understanding that there are other people that might have some interest. Uh, there has been some interest there in other places. One was a bed and breakfast. One was some kind of a operation for a church group. Uh, there's many, many others that have looked at the property for uses that really are dissimilar to what we would want to have in our neighborhood. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to speak? Is there anyone else in the back there? I see your hand going like this. Please state your name and address. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Christina How about into the Atwood. mic. Into the mic, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, Christina record. Atwood, 241 Woodbury Road. I'm one of the 24 vulnerable properties. I've been in my home almost 14 years. I specifically came here from Newtown in a historic house where I lived for 30 years to settle in the historic district. I very much support what Jean King has said and what Mr. Norman, um, and I concur with what he said. All of the letters in support of this change come from people who have another vested interest. I'm gonna quote one of them who, when I looked him up, he's actually only been in his house for one year, though he's been in the neighborhood since 2008. He claims that 325 Woodbury Road at this time is best suited for a business because it has no garage. The house is many years old, very large, has a high purchase price, and is on a main road. Well, sorry to say that that's quite a few of the houses these days on Woodbury Road, and none of these letters are from someone who lives on Woodbury Road. None of us support this. This, is, this goes against how we feel about historic properties. Now I'm gonna be two doors down from the recently approved adult daycare, and now three doors down from a legal practice that's not gonna be a residence anymore. It's changing the whole character of the road, and I'm just very disappointed that our town cannot support one area where we can have historic properties. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any other comments? Over there, sir. Please state your name and address. My name is Joe Sheehan. I live at 259 Woodbury Road. I've been there for 45 years. I'm sorry, sir, your last name? Sheehan, S-H-E-E-H-A-N. Uh, I agree with the eloquence of everyone else, but out of the 24 homes that are most affected, there's also the other homes in the surrounding area that will also suffer a decline in value. Um, so many of the people that moved in those 24 homes were young people that thought, it's never gonna change, it's always going to look like this. And uh, I saw the effect on our last meeting on some of the people that put every penny they had into their homes, and it's going to be affected for the benefit of one, a law firm that could go anywhere and do well. Doesn't have to come in for the benefit of one law firm, the effect it's going to have on 24 others in a peripheral area. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from the public? Any other comments over on the right here? Please, into the mic, state your name and address. I'm Catherine Danino. I live at 39 Hamilton Lane. 
I am adjacent to this particular property that's sort of in question, even though I know there's 24 other properties. I'm not going to repeat everything that everyone else said because I agree with them. I bought my house in 2000, and I saw what a beautiful neighborhood it was. I The, the property in question at 325 Woodbury, which they're right, was changed. That used to be a circular driveway on 6. The previous owner changed the driveway to be on Hamilton Lane. I just uh, in, put in quite a bit of money in my backyard to make it more beautiful because I figured I would be staying there for quite some time. I've never been to his planning and zoning meeting in, ever, but when I knew this was happening, I am concerned. I'm concerned that my property values are gonna go down. And so I thought to myself today, do I have to move? Do I have to sell my house quickly? before, okay, I don't mind a law firm maybe, although I do because I don't want a parking lot. My side yard is adjacent to the entire backyard of this particular property that um, is trying to be sold to this attorney. What I see is a beautiful pond right now and trees and landscape and everything. I don't want to look out and now see a parking lot. It, and I am concerned right away that it is going to diminish the value of my home, that I've worked very hard in the last 20 years to um, upgrade it. I've done the inside. I've done outside work. I just put $50,000 into my backyard for my pool and my patio and whatnot to make it beautiful. So even if people see it from the road, they can see what I've done. Um, my other question and my concern, because I don't really know how these procedures work, is I did hear you say if th after this meeting, if something gets passed, you're going to go to the architectural part of what's going to happen at 325. Does that mean it's too late? Does that mean we've lost as, as the, the public people? Because, okay, say you don't approve the architect, does that mean then it goes back to residential? Or it just means they have to come back with new architecture it's working. Can I ask that question? Or it's a little, little confusing as to what is the, what is the nature? What are you? Saying? What I'm saying is, I don't know what happens after this meeting. If I had heard the attorney, I believe say. If, if it goes through, if something goes through, I don't know, they're going to bring up then the architecture of the design of what they want to do to right. 325 there Woodbury. Will, there, there will be a site plan that will come forth. Okay. At that point, does that mean it's, it's a done deal, that this attorney can buy this and that you're going to change the zoning then? First, the zone has to change. Okay. So, okay, so can you tell me what happens next after this meeting? The commission will consider your testimony, uh -huh. the applicant's testimony, and we will then make a decision. Oh, and then that's it. So, I mean, there's no, like, this is it. This is our one shot right here is what you're saying. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, well, I do agree with what um, everyone else had said about the beauty of the neighborhood, and I am very concerned. I, I worked, like I said, I worked hard. Um, I lived there alone for a long time, and I put a lot of my um, sweat equity into that house. And to think that my values are going to go down is just, it's just heartbreaking. And that's what I want to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you, ma'am. And I believe I did see somebody else wanting to comment way in the back there. <clears throat> Please state your name and address into the mic. Okay. Denise Russ, 135 Porter Street, Watertown. I wasn't going to speak tonight, but listening to all these residents, and they love their homes, they love the area. No one here spoke tonight in favor of this change. If this commission votes in favor of the change, you're not listening to the residents. You're not listening to us and you're not doing what's best for the town and what they want. We already have an attorney's office on Main Street that has a large parking lot when you go down past it. And then we'll have something, I don't know what they're planning, but if you close the hearing tonight, 
do we get to speak about how the architect and what the structure is going to be? Or yes. are we out of the loop with that? You're not out of the loop. We can say we like the architectural design or not, and we could make changes at public participation? Yes. Okay. And also, <clears throat> this piece, excuse me, this piece of property they're saying has a swimming pool and a pond and other things. Why would an attorney's office want to buy a house with all of that? Are they going to just cover it all in, make it grass? I don't understand the logic of this one piece of property, why they want it. As Jane King stated, there's other pieces in town and everything else. So I do hope you do deliberate, you do not close the hearing and let these people come back, see the architectural drawings before anything is done. And if you vote in favor, yes. I have no faith in anybody. Thank you. Any other comments from uh, the public? Any other comments from the public? Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, I believe it goes back to Thank the you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. <clears throat> when I open my, with my comments, trying to differentiate between your legislative and your administrative functions. Most of these people, and they have concerns, <clears throat> are concerned about 325 Woodbury Road, what's going to happen at that piece. That's not before the commission tonight. What's before the commission tonight is the 24 pieces on Woodbury Road that would be affected by this proposed tax change. Little misunderstanding, if the commission sees fit to approve the text change, we then have to come back with a special permit and a site plan approval, which would have engineering, architectural, uh, design features that this commission has to review and, and the public would get a second bite of the apple as far as that goes. Um, Mrs. King opened with, <clears throat> why didn't you just change this one piece? And then she acknowledged spot zoning. You can't just change the one piece. We spoke with this commission back in October about what we wanted to do, and here we are. Uh, another gentleman talked about duplexes and triplexes and how they affect adjacent properties. Um, apples and oranges, actually, basically, and what we're dealing with. Um, everyone has been dealing with and concerned about this 325 Woodbury Road. What's going to happen? How can you do that? That's not in front of the commission tonight. What's in front of the commission is three simple text, proposed text changes to allow a professional office. Your regulations currently allow for 19 uses within the R20 zone. We're just adding one to it. We're asking you to add one more use to that. It's not something that dramatic that is going to be the end of the world. People have to remember, if you do see fit to grant this, 24 property owners within this district are going to have the same ability that my client would have to change their, to change their home to an office if they see fit. Many of the existing houses out there, residences out there, wouldn't be appropriate for an office. But, you know, we're not doing something to hurt the property owners, to hurt the neighbors. It's giving them an additional means to do something with their property. I don't know if the commission has any other questions of me, so. What I would like, if you would, uh, Sir Attorney McFerry, I would like you to read uh, what you have on the material that you submitted on October 21st, mm -hmm. uh, where it deals with <coughs> reasons uh, for the proposed amendment, and then also the impact of the proposed amendment. Though, I, if you would read those Certainly. two statements there, I think are relevant. Okay. Um, under section 60.2.3, we're required to provide a reason for a proposed amendment. The applicant is a law firm presently located in Waterbury, Connecticut, with a satellite office in Woodbury, consisting of six full-time attorneys and support staff. It has been in existence since 1969 and has continued to expand and serve the legal needs of the greater Waterbury area. They've been searching for a location to relocate its practice in the area. The lo location at 3 325 Woodbury Road consists of a residential dwelling containing 8,600 square feet located on 3.3 acres of land. This has been on the market for a considerable period of time and fits the needs of the applicant for a new office. 
There are very few families who would be seeking a residence of this size, but it fits the need of the applicant for an office conversion. The impact of the proposed amendment, the conversion of the property from residential to professional office would have no noticeable impact on the surrounding neighborhood. The only visible addition to the property would be a sign for the firm an increased parking area in a 3.3 acre site. Plan of Conservation and Development on page 4-8, four, page four objective 3.2, stresses the promotion of commercial development in areas with supporting transportation and utility infrastructure. The town should promote business growth in areas that are served by sanitary sewer and water infrastructure. Objective 3.1 states that the most important goal of economic development is growing Watertown's grand list. Growth in, in non-residential development can help diversify the tax base and reduce the reliance on single-family households. In addition, the growth and diversification of the local tax base will provide the town with the financial resources they needed to implement many of the recommendations of the Plan of Conservation and Development. Plan of Conservation and Development in, in Objective 3-3 recommends that zoning regulations and development standards be evaluated to determine if districts, uses, setbacks and definitions, parking requirements, and other requirements are appropriate. This should also determine what impact particular regulations may have on economic development efforts. Route 6, where the property is located, is located in a principal arterial road, POCD 3-7, which in, 19, in 2015, according to the Plan of Conservation and Development, averaged 9,200 vehicles per day. The conversion of a large residential property to professional offices would result in minimal change in these traffic flows. The uh, material that you have gathered here comes from a plan of conservation and the development. The town's plan of conservation and development, yes. Which was a 10-year plan that is required by the state of Connecticut that we draft. And this was drafted in 2018, so right. therefore it will disappear at another within that 10-year span. So these are recommendations by a plan of uh, people who feel that there is a future direction. That's the whole idea behind a plan of conservation and yeah, development. My understanding, a plan of conservation and development is not a directive. It's a recommendation for future growth. And, future, and as you know, every 10 years, a town is supposed to implement a updated POCD. So. Right. And that's where you got this material. Exactly. And these are the recommendations. Yes. OK. Any questions from members of the commission? Um, Down here. Questions. Yes, Commissioner. Um, you know, we, we've listened to both sides, and I really just want to give my thoughts. I, I think that a town needs to move forward, and I believe if we're not moving forward, we're moving backwards. I do think we need to look into the future. Um, I do think mm -hmm. professional offices on that Rule 6 will not hurt that area. I think in this particular property of 325, I think that it, it would fit well there <coughs> out of all the places. I do think that, um, you know, I'd rather see something like that than a true family structure where more traffic or more of a tax burden, where this will actually be a, a tax positive for us versus a negative. Um, I, see a, I see a positive change for that, for the future of Watertown. I do think we need to be forward thinking. I think everything is changing. It's not like it used to be. I think the millennials and Generation X are not looking for bigger homes. They're looking for smaller homes or what they call hoteling, where they all share a home and share a kitchen and a room. So I think the dynamics of our world are changing really rapidly, and I think we need to consider looking at Watertown on what we need to do to change in order to keep up with modern times. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Now, again, one step at a time, should the commission see fit to approve this, and we do come back with a special permit site plan application. At that point, we can give you pictures, photographs, of what the current Grady and Riley office is in Waterbury. It's a very similar building up on Buckingham Street in Waterbury. It's not something that has any detrimental effect on the neighborhood there. So it's, it's that kind of thing. I agree. I see a lot of uh, 
offices in Woodbury, West Hartford, and other small towns that are in a residential historic district, and, and they seem to fit very well there. I, I personally don't see um, where this will affect real estate. I mean, I think real estate gets affected on its own. Just even on my street, a gentleman bought a house, and when he sold it, he lost 250000 with no professional buildings just because of the way the real estate market is. So I think, you know, real estate goes up and down, and I think that, you know, in this particular home, I'm not sure if he even is getting his money out of what he's selling it for. I don't even know what he's selling it for, but sometimes people put more money into their homes than it's valued. Um, and they'll never get it out. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case with this gentleman or not, but um, I do think that valuations of homes, the market dictates what happens. I'm not sure a professional office will change that. Thank you. Any other comments from uh, members of the commission? Yes, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Cavallo, I fully agree with what you said. You're not moving forward, you're, you're moving back. That, that is very well said. And I also agree that uh, millennials are looking for smaller homes. Um, but there was something that really caught my attention uh, from one of the speakers uh, that uh, missed you in the sweater. You said that uh, historic, it won't go back. And, and that's very true, that if a property is changed, it, it won't go back. And it, it really can't. It can't go back to its original roots because it would be way too expensive to get it back to how it currently is. Um, I do have a lot of, uh, um, I've worked a lot with historic homes, so I know what it takes. Um, and I was feeling like I would be in favor of this. Um, but that area, I think you, uh, by changing it, you lose a lot of the character of the town. And, and if we're not going forward, we're not going back. But if we don't remember where we're from, we're going to forget who we are. Is, is what I'm concerned about. Um, not to say that I'm not for this, but I'm, I definitely have to think it through. Um, and I, I, would, I do want to say, to your point, you're absolutely right. Once you change these homes, they'll never go back. You'll never get that original character back. And they've been there for, you know, 100 plus years. And um, it, it's who Watertown is. So I think we need to really think about that and what we're willing to change, especially in that area of town. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very much pro-business, and I would love to see uh, businesses come in. Um, I just don't want to sell our soul to get them in. That's all. Any other comments from members of the commission? Yes, through the chair. Yes. Yes, for this, uh, this for me is very difficult because I, I'm an attorney, and I know the attorneys, all the attorneys. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, I do have a concern about one parcel impacting 22 parcels uh, where we have neighbors who object and we actually have to change their zone. They've lived in these uh, homes for many years. It has a distinct character to the neighborhood. Um, it was a neighborhood that I used to live in. And, um, um, and I, think, I think world of, of the law firm, I think it's a beautiful home. However, um, I, 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 want, I think we owe some deference to the neighbors and the people whose zone we're going to actually change. And, um, um, and that's a, this is a difficult decision. This is, a, this is a beautiful home, beautiful area, and a very prestigious law firm with a good reputation. Uh, but I think that we, all have, to, we have to all take this seriously and um, not jump on it just because it might be commercially feasible or a larger tax base or something that's going to help the town. I think that that area across the street from Taft School is a special area, and I think we ought to recognize it as such. That's all. If I might respond, Mr. Antonesi, just by adding a 20th permitted use to the R20 zone, there's no requirement that the properties have to be used for that. It, then it becomes incumbent upon the property owner to say, well, maybe I can use it. Maybe I can use it for a day camp, or maybe I can put an office in there. Just because it's an available use is no requirement that it has to be used for that. It's just another option available to the property owners. I understand what you're saying, yes. Thank you. 
Thank you. Is there any other comments from the members? Of Through the, the chair. Commission? Yes, sir. I uh, have to second what Commissioner Antonacci said, and you got 24 people out there that we're affecting. Not one of them want it. That's what we're voting on tonight. Not one of them want it, and I agree with them. I don't think it's uh, appropriate. People worked hard on their homes, put a lot of money into them, and uh, I think we should listen to what they're saying. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Any other comments? <clears throat> Future uh, comments, uh, last chance for the uh, public. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Would you please come, come to the mic? I believe you were here before. Just re, re, ma'am, restate your name and address, please. Sure. Chris Atwood. Sorry, wasn't on. Chris Atwood, 241 Woodbury Road. I'd like to know what other properties in Watertown this prestigious law firm had looked at besides 325 and why this is targeted and not the Munson House, which obviously we need to find a use for. Mr. Chairman, that has absolutely nothing to do with the application. Right. Okay, I, I well, I, I asked it. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from the public? Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. Please state your name mm. and address again. Catherine Danino, 39 Hamilton Lane. A question, when you said um, it could be a tax benefit, I think it was Mr. Cavallo, um, bringing this business in. Does that mean my taxes will go down? I'm adjacent to the neighbor, to, to this property? Or anyone else's? I just don't know how that works. You said it would be a tax benefit to whom? The town? To the town. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Any other comments? Last chance? Yes, ma'am. Mike. Okay. Um, Karen Rogopoulos, I'm sorry, I have a cold. I have a cold, sorry. 47 Woodbury Road. Um, this does lower everyone's values. And you were talking about millennials. Um, I live in an area, which many of you know, top of Academy Hill, Woodbury, the one way. Um, 211 obviously sold. That was over 5,500 square feet. Across the street, um, oh, 47 Academy Hill, the old Merriman House just sold over 6,000 square feet. These are all to young people. Um, seven Woodbury Road to newly young married couples, over 4,000 square feet. Uh, the Hamilton Avenue House just sold. Um, 28 Academy Hill also sold. Um, these are all young families. I'm in the business, so to say that young couples are not buying larger homes is incorrect. You can't pick 24 houses, or is that right, 24? And people have broken their backs working sometimes more than one job to keep their houses and maintain a beautiful area of Watertown. And aside from that, I do have clients who have expressed interest in this property as a residence and was put off by someone. So there is outside interest. Thank you. Any other public? Any other public? Any other public? Seeing none, um, we are going to ask the applicant, is there any more is issues that you want to bring Just forward Just a couple to? of comments, Mr. Chairman. Um, the fact that properties are selling is great, but it's got nothing to do with this particular application. Um, the fact that everyone has spoken against this tonight, this is not an election, it's not a popularity contest. Zone changes, text changes are based upon state statute, based upon your regulation. If the commission in its legislative capacity feels in its own discretion that the zone change being requested is, is permitted, doesn't matter if you have, a, if everyone here is, is against it. It's, you're not elected, or I'm assuming, I don't know if you're elected or appointed, uh, but it, it, it's not an election. It's not a popularity contest. Um, the fact that um, 
people have been looking at these houses. Again, the fact that there may be other potential buyers for this house, who cares? It's got nothing to do with this particular application. Because again, we're not talking about 325 Woodbury Road. We're talking about a R20 so. text change. Okay. That's okay, that's, we, uh, before we close uh, public participation and various comments by the applicant, I believe we have some letters uh, there that are one is from the Economic Development Chairman. Would you please read that into the record? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a letter here from the Economic Development Commission dated November 30th to Mr. Richard Antonetti, Chairman, Watertown Planning and Zoning Commission, 61 Echo Lake, Water, uh, Watertown, Connecticut, regarding proposed text amendment to the Watertown Zoning Regulations from Attorney Michael McVeary to allow professional office uses by site plan special permit within the R20 Zoning District limited to properties fronting on Connecticut Route 6 Woodbury Road. Dear Mr. Antonetti, as chairman of the Watertown Economic Development Commission, I would like to offer my personal support of the above captioned item on your upcoming agenda. It is my feeling that adding professional services to the approved uses for the zone will positively add to the economic development of the area and the town in general. Sincerely, Joseph McGreal, Chairman, Watertown Economic Development Commission, what a carbon copy to Mark Massoud. I believe you have other letters of support. Yes. Would you please read the name and the letter? Yes, there are 15 letters in support. Um, the first one I have is we from... We have to listen to all no, 15. Oh, okay. yeah. We're, we're, I would like to vote on that. Yeah, like I don't want to listen to 15 letters. All 15 letters. No None way. of those people are here. Obviously, okay. considering the COVID situation, people are very concerned about large gatherings. Obviously, they will not come, a lot of them. How about the name and address? Okay. Well, we can do name and address and maybe... a. Brief, how long are the letters? Uh, how long are the letters? They're, they're short, but there's like 15 of them. Um, in support, I have one letter against. Through, through the chair. Yes. Car Carol, do, do all those letters have addresses on them? Um, I did not get a chance to look today. Uh, yes, they do, from what I can see, yes. So can we maybe just get the name and address? And the address. That will be fine if everybody's agreed on that. Agreed. 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 Okay. Go, okay. Carol. <coughs> so the first one is from John Lombard, uh, 97 Buckwheat Hill Road, Watertown. Another from Giovanni Orsini, 325 Woodbury Road. Um, A-I-M-E-E, -E, Amy Roberts. Uh, 150 Northwest Drive, Plainville, Connecticut. It looks like it came from a school. Mr. She Chairman. lives at 65 Hamilton Lane. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, Giuseppe Paletta, 25 Lakeview Drive. Joseph, N-O-U-J-A-L-M, 33 Southview Drive, Watertown. Michael Kovaleski. 109 Warwick Road, um, Angelo LOI, 195 Neal Drive, Michael Destazi, 86 Windy Ridge Drive, Angela Destazi, 70 Lakeview Drive, Paul Gelati, 21 Birch Street, Donna Donato Orsini, 115 Sandbank Road, Carm, F-A-R-E-S-E, um, 325 Woodbury, no, I'm so sorry. I don't see an address for him. I don't see an address from him. Bruno and Mary DeSisto. I know that they live on Buckingham Street. I don't see an address for them. And Luigi Mancini, 57 Corolla Drive. And uh, latest one, David Rosa, 92 Buckwheat Hill Road. So 
So those are the 15. And what is, you believe you have one negative? Yes, I have one negative, and it's from Patricia R-U-D-Z-A-V-I-C-E. I can't pronounce her name. What is a V-C? And she lives at 553 Thomaston Road. Thank you. As you see, we are here rather late. We are more than happy to hear from the public. And we will have a little chance uh, to make a decision as to where we will be going. If you'd like to stay, please do. But we will be making a decision on that matter. Do I have a motion to uh, possibly continue the public hearing? A motion has been made to close <coughs> rather than continue for further discussion among members. A motion has been made. Is there a second? Is there a second? Is there a second? Hearing none, the motion fails. Do I have a motion to continue the public hearing? Through the chair, I'd like to make a motion to continue the hearing. Motion has been made. Do I have a second on that? And who made that motion, oh, please? Carol. Ken. Do I have a second? I second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, the motion is carried unanimously. Okay, let's move on the agenda further forward. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank the commission for their time tonight. That's right. And have a good uh, night, everybody. Have a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas, yes. That's right. Mm. Next matter is uh, dealing with a matters you might all be interested in, a 75-foot, four 75-foot poles, lighting poles across the street from you. So you might be back to look at these 75-foot poles across the street at the... I hope you're all listening to that. <laughs> we know how to clear a room, huh? <laughs> the matter that's on the agenda is new business, a plan for 70-foot uh, poles over at a lighting up a field uh, at the Taft School on Woodbury Road. 75 foot, uh, 70 foot poles, not 75. Yeah. Would you like to uh, comment on that? I'll just say you introduce. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Jake Auden, the CFO at Taft, and I have with me Mike Mahoney. Uh, who works with Musco Lighting and is working with our design and architect to design the lighting system. I'm sorry, I did not get your name. First name is Jake, and the last name is Odden, O-D-D-E-N. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, I guess just as a brief introduction, the field, right. um, as you can, as the committee can see in the front here, perhaps, unfortunately we lost our easel over here. We have, I believe you sent the... the okay. So the field location is, is, just to clarify for anybody in the back or, or for you all, is right in the center of campus. Um, it's, at the, it's actually below the tennis courts that quite a bit of the community uses um, at the bottom of a hill right behind all of the lower campus structure. Um, and then going up the hill is where most of the athletics actually take place these days. But this is one field um, that's sort of on the lower, lower tier of the campus, if you will. Um, and the project, um, was one that we had approved um, last March or April, or actually not until not until July. Sorry, there's a couple different projects going on, and uh, and it's under construction in terms of the field being converted from grass to a turf field. Um, so it's a multi-purpose sports field, and um, we would like to install athletic lighting similar to what you would see at a lot of athletic fields around. Actually, I think at the high school and and other places around the state um, to enable whether it be soccer games or other sporting events to take place in the evening, it would mostly be um, probably a handful of times in the fall and a handful of times in the spring. And with that, um, 
I know Mike has some slides that can sort of speak to, um, you know, how these lights might be able to settle in and work well with the broader surrounding. Terrific. Thanks, Jake. For the record, Mike Mahoney with Musco, M-U-S-C-O, lighting. In the first slide I've got up here just depicts the fact that sports lighting is not immune to advancements in technology. So 45-ish years ago on the far left, that's what, what we're, all of these poles are the same height. They're all producing the same amount of light out on the field. And you can see in 1977, more than half the light that we were producing at the top of the pole is actually being blown skyward and creating sky glow. You could tell for miles around whether there was a ball game at night. Over the years, we thought we were doing, uh, um, making great strides uh, as we pushed that envelope further. But today, you can see in the far right, that's what we're able to do now with LED. Because we have, um, there's actually a couple hundred different diodes in each of these fixtures as opposed to harnessing the energy, the electrical energy of one single lamp and trying to manipulate the amount of light that it produces, forcing it down onto the field. Now we're able to pinpoint the diode, each of those 200 plus diodes in each fixture and push the light down onto the field. If we could go to the next slide. If we could, it's cut, if you could scroll so we can see the poles to the, my left. <laughs> uh, one of the always very um, big talking points, big uh, areas of concern is how do we arrive at a 70 foot mounting height? Why can't we use 40 feet? Um, and the simple fact of the matter is it's, it's just it's geometry for us. So in this case we have four poles so each pole, the lights on each of the four poles are responsible for lighting one quadrant of the field. So the fixtures themselves at the top of the pole have to be aimed out, the brightest point of that beam has to be aimed out to the center of the field. So you can see here, if the light fixture is aimed on a 40 foot pole, you can see light fixtures aimed to the center of the field, but a bunch of that light in the upper part of that beam is being cast over the field onto adjoining properties because the aiming angle is too shallow. We take that pole, make it 70 feet tall, now we sharpen that aiming angle, direct the light downwards. Now we've kept the same aiming point, but because that angle is now more acute, we're cutting off that light much sharper. And if we go to the next slide, this is where you'll see the, the four pole locations, the S1 and S2 poles, which are on the, the top side of the field. Um, those are both, they're actually all four 70 foot poles. The S1 and S2 are actually on a seven foot grade increase, which really helps us because those poles have to be further away from the field. So, the height of the fixtures is actually 77 feet. Um, and those fixtures need to be aimed approximately 165 feet to get from that pole out to the center of the pitch. To get at least a 25 degree aiming angle, which is industry standard for, for um, sharp glare control, spill control, um, we apply a cotangent of 2.145 to get that angle. That gives us a mounting height. The straight math is 76.92 feet. So in this case, we're at 77. It's pretty damn close. Um, so that's how we arrived at, at that particular height there. On the bottom side, S3 and S4, those poles are much closer to the field. Um, so it's, again, with 70-foot poles, um, we're aiming those about 148 feet and again apply the correct cotangent and that gets us the straight math is 69 feet, closest size pole is 70. So that's um, 
basically the, the mathematics behind how we arrive at the appropriate pole height. Um, again, there's four poles. The S1 and S2, I believe, have, S1 has nine fixtures, S2 has 10, S4 is nine, and the other one has 10. So um, very balanced um, amount of light. It's an appropriate amount of light for the level of play out at this field, so it's not being overlit, it's not being underlit, it's lit to an appropriate safe amount of light. If we can go to the next slide. What we've done here is just show, um, and I apologize, it's, it's, these numbers are so small, but you could, you'd be able to see that as the further you get away from the field, um, there's some practice areas out in what we call the D areas, um, just to, to, towards the track corners, but those, you're getting into single digits as far as foot candle levels. The field itself, those 84 target points average 50 foot candles, and then as we feather out towards the edges of the, of the track area, we're down into the single digits, like around four, five, three, two foot candles. The next slide. What we've done here is isolate uh, on that contour line. That's where the foot candles average So again, we're just trying to, to depict how well we're able to control the light, really focus it down on the field. The distance between each of those target points is um, 30 feet. So you can see just 60 feet beyond the field, we're down to a one-tenth of one foot candle, which is a very minimal amount of light. And if we go to the next one, here we've isolated um, 150 feet around the facility and those again every 30 feet we're taking a reading the average of those target points is three tenths of one foot candle so again just want to further depict how well we're able to focus the light onto the pitch and if we went to the next one this is a picture of the, the light fixtures themselves. You can see every one of them is a, um, has an external visor. They're full cutoff, dark sky friendly. Zero light is emitted above the fixture. So if you think back to that original slide where we had all that light being blasted upwards, here all that light is being pushed down onto, onto the playing surface. Um, again, a very, very dark sky friendly approach with zero uplight, full cutoff. Next slide, please. Uh, just, I've got a couple pictures which just kind of depict real life applications. Uh, this would be a very similar application, 50 foot candles, horizontal, uh, and you can see just how sharply the, the light is cut off around the perimeter. Next slide, uh, another one, and the next. I uh, just also always want to mention the fact that um, Musco, we've been around for, I believe it's our 45th year. We um, work very closely with the National Parks Association. Uh, with International Dark Sky Association. We have a member of our uh, company who sits on their board. Uh, we're continually pushing forward to protect our night skies. Um, this particular design that we're presenting tonight would meet the International Dark Sky Association community-friendly lighting guidelines. So, um, you know, it, it, like I said, it's just a, a very, um, it's a design that's done with neighbors in mind, with wildlife in mind, with energy conservation in mind. The school also has the ability to not only utilize the 50 foot candle option, but because it's LED, there's a high, medium, low setting. So if they're out there just practicing, 
and they can hit a button and cut the volcano levels in half, reduce their energy by 50%. Um, There's a tennis court. If people just want to play Frisbee at night, they can cut it down even further, reduce the energy by 75%. So uh, there's wireless controls, so the school can schedule a time for the lights to turn on and turn off. It would be a, a hard off at a, whether it's predetermined by yourselves or the school. Um, it's a, there's a very um, simple yet complex control system that goes with it to ensure that the, the lights are managed very well. It, this is uh, not like the old system where you needed time to warm up and then to downtime. That's correct. It's, it's instant on, instant off. Right. Yep. The, uh, the issue as far as uh, I don't think we are, we are interested, yes, in the lighting, but we are also interested in the impact that it will have on the neighborhood. And the neighborhood, as you have seen, is where the lighting will be impacting. Sure. And the 70 foot uh, towers will be impacting this neighborhood. So I think we will have to set this for a public hearing to have the opportunity and openness for the public to see this. And I, I believe there should be someone present to explain other than lighting, you know, because of the fact this is not, they do not have a lighted uh, soccer field currently. It will generate therefore games, championship games, number of games, number of cars, traffic. This is all a matter that should be brought to the attention of the public for openness and understanding of what is going to take place. So I would urge you be prepared for that. And I would like a motion that we set this for a public hearing on January 5th. And according to the calendar that I've looked at, it is not the 6th, it is the 5th. Yep. So uh, moved. The motion has been made. Do I have a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded for this. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Abstain? Motion is carried unanimously. We can move on to the next matter. Thank, Thank you. you, gentlemen. Thanks, Thank you very much. See you next year. A very enlightening presentation. <laughs> No pun intended. <laughs> uh, oh. Guys, come on now. That's as good as his jokes get. Yeah. <laughs> That's my best line yet. No, All right. Be in your uh, so next one is <laughs> the next one is uh, setting a public hearing for a subdivision uh, for Michael Jed for a proposed two lot subdivision on uh, Eight Sandbank uh, Road. Map number 163, block 21, lot number 8. And this public hearing would also be on January 5th, 2022. Do I have a motion? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, if I you may. I want to present something quick, if we could. For which? I believe this is for the Michael Jed. Oh, the, yes, you're here, yes. Um, yes, for the record, Brian Baker with Civil One, uh, licensed engineer in the state of Connecticut. Um, after reading the agenda, I had contacted Mark and had a discussion about the fact that um, for an initial subdivision, you are not required to have a public hearing. Of course, it's up to you, it's in your jurisdiction to. Um, obviously, for a re subdivision after so a parcel's been subdivided and it gets subdivided again, or for larger subdivisions, obviously, <clears throat> you always have public hearing. So uh, this is only a one lot or two lot subdivision. We're breaking one piece off of the farm. It's a family subdivision. They're basically um, taking a piece off and so that the son can have a uh, home site. Um, so I don't know if, if you'd like me to give you a brief overview and then perhaps you could decide whether uh, it, you feel a hearing is warranted. It's a two-lot with a housing in the rear, uh, one driveway. Uh, is that what I understand? I yeah, so... Comes in from Concord. I think. I have a question through the chair. Yes. Are, are you sure it's not a resubdivision that they didn't chop off that corner of 
on Olive and whatever those two roads are there. Yeah, so it, <clears throat> it's a bit confusing, but I'll, right. I'll lay it out for you. Here's, this was in here's front of how us it before. works. So there that's is, maybe why we need the, the public here. Mm -hmm. what the, what the way it goes when you're breaking up properties, um, your first cut off of a piece is called a free split. Right. That does not have to come before the commission. Uh, that just gets filed. On, you draw the map, sure. zoning yes. reviews it, you file it on the land right. record, it's done. Next time you spit a piece off, that's the first subdivision. That's where we are with this piece. If you break off, then you, if you go to break off additional pieces after that, that's a resubdivision subject to a public hearing automatically. Uh, so we are in the... You don't know what you're talking about, but does that make sense, Mark? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm confused, so, all right. Yeah. Um, so I believe you have 11 by 17s. I do have some of the larger maps. Right, uh, I've got it in front of me. If anybody wants to take a, a peek, and I've got the boards here. Um, so basically what it is, it's a 43-acre parcel, uh, tax map lot 8, uh, Sandbank Road. Um, Michael Jett is the applicant. The property is currently owned by his mother, two aunts, and an uncle. Um, East, so Michael came to us. They want to split off one piece up in the corner for a house, leave the remainder as the farmland. We have shown a house and septic on that remaining 40 some odd acres because when you break off a piece, you, even though we have 40 acres left over, we still need to show that you could put septic house and well. Um, but yeah, the, sure. the goal is to build on the smaller piece. That's lot two, right? The one you're not going to build? Correct. Okay. Correct. We're, we're building on lot one. Right. Um, so the property has frontage along Sandbank Road. Um, down in the lower area, you see the cornfields when you drive by. Uh, it's wooded, and there's a wetland area in the northeast corner. There's also a 50-foot access strip, a town right away, off a of Concord Drive that comes into the property that was left back when the Concord Drive subdivision was done for access to this piece and potential road or whatever we want to do to access it. So uh, <clears throat> what we're doing is coming from that upper Concord Road Drive access. Uh, we're going to extend the right of way and put in a common driveway uh, that will serve lot one, which is the one that's going to be more immediately built upon. Um, so <clears throat> we have been before wetlands. Uh, they have reviewed and approved it. Um, you can see we sort of moved the driveway, gave it a little curvature to pull it away from the wetlands in that area. Um, so that would be creating a, a 4.23 acre parcel on the upper area, uh, leaving the remainder to remain as uh, in its current use as farmland. So that's uh, the basic use. Um, because it's a family subdivision uh, and it would be going to the sun, uh, open space is not required. Um, for all intents and purposes, this is still functioning, going to function as a farm and open space. Uh, they have no <clears throat> immediate plans to do any additional development. However, we did, <clears throat> you know, just for good planning, we laid out this right away in accordance with your town road standards. So, you know, if, if, if ever the town or future developer wanted to extend the road through and connect, you could do that. Um, there's no intent to do that this time, but obviously for planning purposes, if we're going to show an extension of the town road right away and put a driveway in there, we want to make sure it's geom geometrically, as far as the curvature and the slope, uh, is, is built to town road standards. Um, but it would only be built as a 12-foot wide driveway for the, for the residents. Um, so that's basically a summary of what we're looking to do. And again, as far as subdivision goes, relatively simple. So it's obviously in your purview if you want to choose to have a hearing, but it's not required. I have, I have a question through the chair. Yes, sir. Qu questions actually for staff. Does this right of way have, does the town have to abandon it to them in order to put a driveway on it? How does the, where does the liability come in when you put a driveway on a right-of-way that the town owns and you're not bringing it up to current road standards. I think we did a little bit of research um, on that and it looks like uh, when Concord Drive, and we couldn't follow it any further when Concord Drive was created, 
obviously that right of way was that rectangle was 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 placed there to obviously to apparently access that that driveway uh, to access that parcel. Uh, Paul was just mentioning that uh, the commission would um, need it was it's being viewed as a shared driveway at this point, and one of the tasks of the commission would be to approve that shared driveway with a. Three quarter, the three shared quarter. driveways are okay in that zone. Well. Yeah. With the three quarter commission vote. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And I'm, I'm, as a side note, I'm not sure how you've handled it in the past with, uh, but I have in other towns worked where we have, <clears throat> you have a common driveway or a residential driveway over a town right of way. Uh, and the property owner, you know, signs a hold harmless farm that, you know, that the town's not responsible for obviously plowing the road. It's, you know, they're not responsible for anything that happens on that, you know, piece. It's simply uh, in basically indemnifies the town of any liability from someone using it as a, you know, as their personal driveway. The town doesn't have to take care of it. They don't have to worry about it. Right. I, I was just going back in time because I've been around for too long a time, and we had an application years ago very much similar to this. If I remember correctly, it, it didn't go anywhere because the town wanted the applicant to bring that whole right-of-way up to road standards. That's what I remember about the last applicant. That's why I asked the question. Whatever deal you make with them, you make with them. I'm not mm -hmm. the decision-maker, so... I believe uh, you have already been to Inland Wetlands and you have approval? Yes, we, we do. Right. So it's uh, up to the commission. Commission, uh, hearing, public hearing or not? If it's not required, I say let's not do it. It's a two-lot subdivision on 43 acres. One? What do you say? It's a, it's a one-lot. It's going to be two lots on 43 acres. It's all family. So What's we'll no, public no public hearing. Down here? I agree. Agree. So, Mark, do we move forward? Sure. Well, we'll, do we need uh, a vote on this for no public hearing or what? It's I think that would clear the air. It's, not. it's just been accepted tonight. Right? Yeah. Um, I think we, they, they have sure, inland wetlands. It doesn't hurt uh, to uh, right. have a vote and decide that there's no public hearing required, and we'll just continue to the next meeting. Let's do it. Okay. Continue to next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, Good. Vote on <laughs> you, can, you can vote on that if you say it. You want to make it? So that we waive public hearing. Good. Well, second. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Abstention, hearing none, no public hearing. Thank you. And we'll work, uh, I'm sure Mark will have, you'll have a, we'll work with you on whatever review you have before the next meeting. Okay, move on. It's cutting into our drink. Heritage Woods. Heritage Woods. You've got a vote on it, right? Heritage Woods, uh, Mark, did you get a clarity on uh, that? You said you're going to give it to the attorney there to see why it took so long. I've had a conversation with the uh, with the uh, applicant, uh, with the letter writers, the owners of the property. Um, I had initiated a contact with the uh, with the town attorney, although I had not at this point heard back from him and. Uh, we're, we're, we're asking that the commission just uh, waive a decision or waive a action tonight we until can table we, it. yes. Do I have a motion to table? So, so moved. Second. Motion made. All those Second. in favor of the table. Aye. 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 All those opposed. Abstention. Motion is carried unanimously. Old business. None. Articles on the agenda for action. Special permit for Carmine for the construction of Garden Brook Estates, 470 Straits Turnpike, Watertown, Connecticut, in a R12-5 age-restricted development zone, parcel ID 
on map I 152. 152. Block uh, 256, lot 3. Do I have a motion on this? I make a motion to accept the special permit 2021 204. Motion is As made. Written. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Abstain. Motion is carried unanimously. Mark. Uh, was that, you said to accept, but was that to approve? Approve, correct. The motion yeah, to it's approve. Written. As written. It's right. It's good. Yeah. That's what I was waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> to approve. <laughs> That's it. Right. Okay. Yeah, he's okay. been here long enough. Yeah. Next matter. <laughs> you got that, Mark? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Next matter. What are we going to do? Have a nice holiday. <clears throat> the next Proposed man. text amendment. We continued. At those uh, continuance, We right? continued it to January the yeah. 5th. Yeah. 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 Yep. And communication and bills. We need a vote. We need to vote. The table, yeah. Okay, who wants to make that motion table? Please. I'll make a motion to table item two. I'll second it. Motion has been made to table item two. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, abstain. Motion is carried unanimously. Okay, communication and bills. Anything, Mark? Uh, no, sir. Uh, informal discussion. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all. Stay healthy. Next meeting is January 5th. We will see you hopefully then. Motion to adjourn. So moved. All those opposed? No. Abstentions. Motion is back. carried unanimously. Recording okay. stopped. Bring your name plates up. Carol's getting tired of doing our work. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll leave mine here for she you. She said that off the mic, though. Bobby, <laughs> phone.